Hi everybody, this is Brendan Baylog from the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group. I've been asked by some people if I might give a bit of an overview of the use of the uh, annual list of U.S. merchant vessels and the annual lists of Canadian vessels for researching uh, shipwrecks and vessels on the Great Lakes, um, for identifying uh, hulls that we might have found uh, on the bottom, for telling the stories of, uh, <clears throat> of vessels on the Great Lakes, and for doing original research, primary source research. So. Um, I'm fortunate in that I, uh, I've collected all of them, the U.S. certainly, and many of the Canadian lists, um, starting many years ago. So uh, it took me about 30 years to acquire the collection. But uh, it gives me a good opportunity to uh, put a pretty good presentation together about these. So without further ado, I'm going to dive in. Um, so um, why do we have these lists? Well, a couple of reasons. It's a, important for a country to know about all of the vessels that it has in the merchant trades, mostly for taxation purposes. Uh, originally, you know, the Customs Act, uh, the Customs Houses on the Great Lakes started around 1800, and, and as that early, there, were all, there was already taxation to support the government. So, um, the government wanted to know about all the vessels that were engaged in commercial commerce, um, not only on the coasts, but also on the Great Lakes. And so they started to, you know, have enrollment documents, customs house enrollment documents, but it was, it's hard to have a list of all the vessels that you can look up. So uh, in 1847, um, the Rogers and Black Marine Roll came out. And this was a private publication, but it made heavy use of the customs house documents. It uh, listed every commercial vessel in the United States, over 20 tons, uh, with many exceptions. I didn't say every. It was heavily slanted towards the coasts. Uh, I'm not sure it had very many Great Lakes vessels in it. I don't have an original copy because they're quite, quite scarce and valuable. Um, but, um, you know, the, because th 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 that sufficed for, you know, maybe 15 years, 20 years, but um, the government eventually became much more serious about it after the Civil War. They really recognized that they needed a list uh, that was handy. <clears throat> and so um, one of the things that happened that really kind of pushed it along was an act in 1864 that changed the way commercial vessels were measured on the Great Lakes. They went from using what's known as Builder's Old Measure to the Morsum system of measurement. And without getting too technical, Builder's Old Measure essentially measured you know, the, the capacity of a vessel like a shoebox, you know, square, uh, length by beam by depth. Whereas the Morsum system um, measured differently. It, you know, took away the unusable spaces. Um, and so it measured the tonnage of a vessel, uh, uh, so it was much lower than, than the builder, builder's old measure. And for a few years, all the vessels on the Great Lakes and on the coast had two different tonnages. So it became very difficult to tell which schooner Mary you were dealing with because you had, if you had two schooners Mary, you had four tonnages, you know, and sometimes they were pretty close, and you know, it was a mess. So the government decided in 1866, July of 1866, an act was, act was passed where all vessels got an official number, right, and uh, it stayed with that vessel throughout her life, even if her name changed, even if she was rebuilt. And they would, initially, they would carve it in the main beam. Of, of a vessel, but it could be carved in a lot of different places. Um, uh, by the main beam, I mean the main cross uh, beam. Uh, so, anyway, uh, with that in place, they were in a good position to start to enumerate the vessels in a, in a, in a published publication. So, in 1867, they published what's known as the Preliminary uh, List of U.S. Merchant Vessels. That's a pretty, pretty rare document. I think only two or three exist. I know there's one at the Milwaukee Public Library in the uh, Great Lakes Maritime Collection there. I think the National uh, Museum of the Great Lakes in Toledo has one. Perhaps a few other collections do, but they're, they're really quite rare. Um, I have a copy, obviously. Um, so, um, but before, if you're trying to research a vessel before 1867, what can you do? Uh, well, not everyone has Rogers and Black. Rogers and Black, I don't even know that it's digitized online. Um, but um, if you're interested in steamships from that period, uh, from before 1867, there's a really good resource out there from the Steamship Historical Society of America. Um, a researcher um, named uh, William Lytle came up with the Lytle List. And what this is, uh, is a list of every merchant steam vessel in the United States from 1807 to 1868. And it's a fairly important book. Um, 
this was uh, replaced in, I think, 1958 by the Holt, by the Lytle Hold Camper list. His protege, Forrest Hold Camper, um, after Lytle's death, updated the list substantially. And so the Lytle Hold Camper list uh, lists every steam vessel from 1790 to 1868. And it's very useful, and it's not a coincidence that it stops in 1868, because that's when the list of merchant vessels starts. So if you need to research a steamship, uh, before the list, <clears throat> these are excellent, excellent books, and they can be obtained. What if it's Canadian, you say? Well, John Mills uh, <laughs> did the Mills list. Canadian uh, Coastal and Inland Steam Vessels, 1809 to 1930. It goes quite a bit later. This is every steam vessel uh, in Canada prior to the Canadian list of vessels, and it's also an excellent publication published by the Steamship Historical Society. Um, so excellent resources. Um, so let's go back to the list of U.S. merchant vessels here. Um, there are uh, a number of caveats as we walk through them. I'm going to walk through some of the some of the idiosyncrasies by year. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. There's an excellent paper published in 1964 in the, the journal American Neptune. For those of you who aren't familiar, that's a, a very uh, prestigious maritime history uh, journal. Um, and in 1964, Forrest Holdcamper published an article where he walked through all of the changes over the years in the annual list of, of U.S. merchant vessels. It's a great paper, so if you want it, contact me. I can email you. I've got a, a digital copy of it. All right, so um, let's walk through. I have my earliest original here is the third annual. It covers uh, vessels in the year of 1870. And I'll give you a look at what it looked like. I'll also put a picture online. You can see that it was bound in three-quarter leather with uh, gilt titling. Uh, this one I've restored. Beautiful marbled boards. Um, but the data that it contains, and that all the early ones contain, is you know kind of scant, really. Um, you get the vessel, you get its signal letters if it was a steamer um, or if it you know was ocean going. You get its name, you get its tonnage. You don't get its dimensions. Oddly enough, you get its horsepower if it's a steamer. <laughs> and you get its home port. And by home port, they mean which customs uh, district it was enrolled at, not necessarily where it was owned. And that's it. So pretty scanty. Um, they, uh, these were published, are bound mostly like this, like you see them in uh, three-quarter leather, although you could also get them unbound. I bought several that were unbound and rebound them. I bound uh, my, uh, I think, my 10th and my 12th. I both I rebound because they were originally uh, made <clears throat> with just paper wraps. All right, so a couple of other caveats about the early years. We don't usually refer to them by year. We refer to them by which annual it is, the first, second, third, fourth, preliminary. The reason we do that is the period of coverage varied. So, you know, the way the fiscal year ran, some ran from July to July, then they ran from December to December. Some ran, you know, uh, across multiple years. And so it's difficult to call them, say, an 1880 or an 1873. So what we refer to them as is the third, the fourth, the fifth, and so forth. Um, that stops in 1884. I'll show you one other thing. This is a um, 14th annual list. The 14th and the 15th um, were bound in cloth, generally speaking, and are obtainable. Uh, they're pretty rare, actually. These are among the rarest. And so really anything before, any of them before 1884 are considered very rare and hard to come by and generally fetch between $100 and $300 on the market. And I'd say a preliminary list might go for four or $500. Um, starting with the 16th annual in 1884, this is an oddball. It was, all of them are in green buckram. Um, and they're a little bit bigger than the others. They, uh, they also still don't list um, the dimensions of the vessels. But they do list uh, the uh, a little bit more information. They list where it was built, and they list the home, the residence of the managing owner, which is kind of kind of interesting. And they break out sailing vessels from uh, from steam vessels. These are quite common, available for around fifty dollars. Um, there are several for sale right now. If you wanted in 1884, starting in 1885 uh, with the 17th annual, they switched to blue buckram, and there's a pretty long running here of blue buckram books. These are available for, you know, 30 to $50. Most years are fairly common. Um, and they're good to have one or two of these, even if you don't want to build the whole set so you can do research. Um, 
A couple of interesting things. 1890, had uh, they decided to try to break the Great Lakes vessels out into their own section. Um, it was a failed experiment. They put them back in, into just the regular list with everybody else. Um, another anomaly is that in the ninth Annual, uh, in eight, around 1877, they tried and published a list of all the vessels that were lost that year. Uh, which was kind of cool. If it, they, they decided it was a nightmare at that point in 1877 to maintain, so they dropped it. But if you do happen to you know, have an 1877, it has a list of, uh, of all the losses. Um, all right. So a couple of other things changed then. 1903, we switched to uh, buckram, uh, tan, I'm sorry, tan, tan cloth covering. And in 1906, an important thing happened. 1906 is the first year that they started to have an appendix listing every vessel that was lost, abandoned, sold foreign, or went out of documentation. And those are the different options for you know, how a vessel can leave registry. It can either be lost, and if it's lost, it'll show how it was lost. It'll say how and where it was lost. <clears throat> um, if it was sold foreign, I think it just says that. It doesn't say what country. It can be abandoned, or it can go out of documentation. Um, there are a couple of reasons a vessel can go out of documentation. It can go out because it was re-measured and was under five gross tons. It could have gotten a yacht exemption if it was really not being used commercially. Um, there are a few other different types of exemptions, but uh, the most common thing, though, it could go out of documentation just because the owner decided not to register it again because they weren't going to use it anymore, um, as opposed to being abandoned, which I think technically means they, they it was rendered unusable. Um, so law, uh, 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 abandoned and out-of-documentation vessels are the ones that ended up on river bottoms and in back bays. And so on the Great Lakes, you know, if you look at the old nautical charts, you'll see these back harbors are filled with little wreck symbols, right? Almost all of those are vessels that were lost or abandoned. Or, I'm sorry, that were abandoned or went out of documentation. So, important thing to note. And so after 1906, all of these have that list of, of abandoned and out of doc documentation vessels. I've tried to make a database of those. I've actually tried to scan through optical character recognition in all of those, and I do, I, I was somewhat successful, I do have my own private database of all the losses of vessels uh, from these. So, um, anyway, let's move on with uh, some of the changes. Uh, as we get into some of the years, 1917 is very rare because it was uh, during World War I. Um, it's a hard, hard year to get. Um, one of the things you'll notice is that the, 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 who printed these and who was responsible for them really changed over the years. It started uh, with the Bureau of Statistics, eventually moving to um, the uh, Bureau of Navigation under the Treasury Department. Then the Bureau of Navigation was moved under the Commerce Department. Then um, you get uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, Bureau of Customs taking over, uh, the Treasury Department. Then you get, uh, down here, the Coast Guard takes over. So the, the ownership of these documents changed, and, and, and consequently the contents did too. In, in these years, they started to introduce lists of vessels owned by the government, vessels owned by different agencies. Um, they started to break the vessels out into different categories, like unrigged barges got their own section, motor vessels got their own section, as opposed to steam vessels. Um, Later years, all vessels were, were, you know, glop, were grouped back together and they quit breaking them out as much. A um, couple of uh, other important things to note. Uh, the World War II years come in two different versions, confidential and restricted. Um, they're worth a little more. Um, there's also no 1953. Uh, there's a, a, an edition here that's just 1953 and 1954. Um, I don't recall. I read once why that was. And then there's also no 1966 or 67. Um, it jumps right to 68, and that's because there was a, a, a large gap where the co before the Coast Guard took over publication. Another thing you're going to see is that starting with the Coast Guard taking over, they get really, really big. You know, and some of these are you know, that thick. And some are in three editions. The 1994 is in three editions. You know, three different books. Why is that? Well, what happened is... Uh, you could do, it started the, to be the case where people started to document their personal yacht uh, because they were using it as a tax exemption or as a second home um, in the tax code, and so they had to they had to document the vessel. 
And so you get all of these, you know, Chris Crafts and Roamers and, you know, um, yachts on the Great Lakes that appear in here. That's kind of cool. Um, if you want to document, if you want to get the history of a, of a yacht and you want to see who the owners were over the years and any changes it went through uh, and who built it and what year it was built, you can, you can do that research in the annual list of U.S. merchant vessels. So that's kind of cool, I think. All right, a couple other interesting things. Um, up until about 1920, you could get, there were, I shouldn't say you could get, there was a congressional edition made for the list of merchant vessels. This is one from 1914. I've also got one from 1890. Um, they were bound ornately. They were usually bound in full leather or three-quarter leather like this. Beautiful marbled boards. Um, the way you can tell, other than the fact that they are just beautifully bound, is that they'll say, House of Representatives or um, U.S. Senate um, in the title uh, page. And these are, uh, I don't know if they're necessarily more valuable than, than the others, but they're kind of cool looking. They're, they're rare. They're, you, you do come across them, though. You do see them for sale. So, all right. Um, other interesting things uh, about the annual lists. Um, um, they finally stopped making them in uh, 1994. There was a gap between 1981 and 89, so there's no 82 to 88. And then there's also none, none between 1989 and 1994. 94 was the last bound year. <clears throat> in 99, they went to an online database. So uh, there's some problems with that. Um, I have the database on, on, on CD. From, from 99, and then, I, of course, it's online now. The problem is that you can't look at a vessel that's gone. So, say a vessel was built in, uh, oh, say 90, 1990, and then it went out of documentation in 2005, and you want to look it up. Well, it'll appear in the 94, you might see it, but you can't tell what happened to it because the online database only lists vessels that are currently active. You can't, I don't know that there's a way to find vessels that have gone inactive in recent times since it went electronic. And that's a shame. Uh, but you can see why they can't publish it as a book anymore. It would be that thick. All right. I'm going to talk about some, some, some uh, uses for these that you might not have thought of and some weaknesses and caveats. The main reason we want to use these is we want to identify vessels. If we find a hull on the lake bottom and we need to know its dimensions, we, we can look in here. You may ask, well, we can just go on to the, the Metzler database or the Labadee database or, you know, Bowling Green or our, our favorite database. True, those databases, though, only list the major, major vessels on the Great Lakes. They don't list all the fish tugs. They don't list all the, you know, runabouts and things like that. These, these do. And so if you need to do primary source research to really find, you know, d d the dimensions of an obscure, obscure vessel, this is your only choice. And... Fortunately, most but not all of these have been digitized and are on Google Books and on a few other sites. Um, uh, Roger, I mean, Walter Lewis has a number of them also. I think most of the early ones, in fact, all the early ones, I think, may be on his site. Um, <clears throat> other things you might want to know. Uh, you can find when, where, uh, and who built a given vessel. Uh, that's particularly interesting in telling stories. Like, I did a paper on all the fish tugs built in the Keweenaw Peninsula one time. And I was able to go through this. It was quite a tedious job, but I was able to find every single vessel ever built in the in the in the copper country, and who built it. And it, it, and before that, nobody knew who all the different builders were. And it was it's interesting because they you know um, all kind of built the same way. And I did that by looking in here. Other things you can do: you can trace the ownership, you can get the owner's address, and you can get the history of of where vessels were owned. That's really important because. You know, the, the book may just say, well, it's enrolled out of Port Huron, you know, or uh, maybe a better example is uh, Grand Haven. But if you go in the back and look at the owner's address, you'll see that he wasn't actually in Grand Haven. He was in, you know, Pentwater, right? But the boat was enrolled at the Grand Haven District. But, you know, because the thing was in Pentwater, that's where it went out of documentation. You know, maybe it wasn't, didn't wreck, but it went out of documentation there. What that means is that it's, pro it's keels probably laying there in, a, in the slough in Pentwater. You know what I mean? So it's important to be able to trace where a vessel was last owned when it, went, when it was abandoned or when it went, went out of documentation because unless somebody cut it up or used the wood for something else, which they frankly didn't usually do because the wood was 
probably rotten from years of water. Uh, it probably just got sunk there. So, important to know. Also, you can find engine information in here, usually horsepower adjust. You won't find cylinder dimensions and things like you would in a marine directory, but you can find the horsepower, you can find the crew complement. Um, and um, most importantly, after 1906, you know, you can find exactly how that vessel left registry, whether it was sold foreign, whether it was, you know, actually wrecked. Um, and, uh, you know, so very useful for that. Now, some weaknesses. As I mentioned, the early years have scant information. They're little more than, than lists, really, of vessels with tonnage and official numbers. But that in and of itself is useful. Um, some vessels weren't struck from the list in a timely manner. And you, there's a lot of people who natter over, well, you know, she was still in the list of merchant vessels for three more years, you know, so we think she was still sailing. Well, she's not in any news articles, and her, you know, and, and the wreck looked pretty severe. Uh, what, that, what happened is people often didn't surrender the paper uh, in a timely manner, and so it, it didn't get updated. That, you find that mostly before 1884. Um, the, as I mentioned, the loss lists didn't start till 06, so prior to 06, you know, you just have to look and see when it disappeared from the lists. You know, if it's, if it's in uh, 1898 and not in 1899, then you know it went out of documentation. You won't know how. You might have to do some newspaper searches or look at the enrollment documents and see what would actually happen to it. Um, and I mentioned also in the 1960s, we start to get bloat from the fiberglass yachts. And I mentioned the fact that it, you know, uh, didn't become electronic until the 1990s. So, um, a couple of, uh, a very, very useful resource. I'm going to talk a little bit now about the Canadian lists. So, uh, the Canadian lists started, uh, I think, in 1874. You can correct me. People may correct me on that. I think it could have been 70. Um, I have um, one of the early lists. The Canadian lists were published by the um, uh, Canadian Marine and Fisheries um, Bureau. And so uh, this is uh, uh, one that I've, re I've made a binding for it. It is an original uh, list, but this is a, a really nice uh, three-quarter leather binding. But you can see it's, it's the original list. This is the list of vessels for 1877 from uh, the uh, Department of Marine and Fisheries. And they've made these every three years in Canada. Um, they were published in what's known as the sessional papers, which is similar to our congressional record. This is the uh, actual uh, list for 1899. This is what they look like, the sessional papers. And this has the, the list, the vessel list in it from Marine and Fisheries. And I'll show some of these on, online um, on the, on the pic, uh, photos. Um, and then uh, the other lists of marine and fisheries that came out later look like this. Um, they are from the Ministry, uh, the Department of Transport. This is a World War II confidential version. But you can see they're a small paperback list, but they do list good information. So if you are interested in Canadian vessel research, um, there you have those. Um, the Canadian vessels. Uh, lists were made from their enrollment customs house system. Uh, they have customs house enrollments as well. Probably the best resource that I know of is the Maritime Museum of the Great Lakes at Kingston. Uh, I can't remember, they, they have a different name now, but uh, they had a wonderful uh, online enrollment database and uh, these papers are also very useful for Canadian vessel research. So um, I think I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, so in closing, um, these are probably some of the most important if not the most important resource, you know, for telling the stories of Great Lakes vessels, for identifying shipwrecks, and, you know, really for, um, if you're doing primary source original research. Um, a lot of this has been put online in databases, but certainly not all. I regularly find use uh, for going back to the original sources, uh, which is why I'm glad I have them. Um, I would recommend, if you really are serious about doing primary source research, that you f get a few years of these. It's not, you know, it's nice to have all of them, of course, because, you know, it always happens that, you know, the, the, the vessel that you find, you know, has disappeared in the year you don't have. <laughs> so, so I eventually acquired them all. But it is useful to have a few. Um, so I would uh, not uh, dissuade anybody from going out and buying a few. They do come up on eBay all the time. They're, they're probably, there's always some uh, available. Uh, being listed for different years and on the used book sites, and they're they're not too pricey. 
uh, you can get them for fairly cheap. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to uh, you know, uh, write them up and email me at uh, brendan at and I hope you enjoyed the uh, presentation. Thanks.